Hi, I'm Mike Gerhauser. On behalf of the other elders and all who gather here, I want to say welcome to Resurgence Church. We are glad that you found us. Now, whether this is your first time joining us or you meet with us regularly, we pray that the message that you're about to hear would encourage you, would edify you in your faith, and would bring glory to God. We also want to encourage you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Don't forget to hit that bell so that you get notifications. And if you want to learn any more about us, you can go to our website at rsgchurch.com. There you can listen to past messages, you can give online, you can check our calendar of events, and you can see our statement of faith. Thank you again for joining us. Pray that you are blessed by the preaching of the word this morning. God bless you. So um, the title of the message this morning, you can see it up there, it's the, the true Israel revealed in the true vine. And um, how I got this title, it, it's actually a conclusion I came to um, when I, be, I began to ask myself a question is, who really is Israel? And why I was asking that question, because I was looking at different doctrines within Christianity, especially those to do with eschatology and um, how, how Israel plays out and the whole thing, this, you know, because you hear every, there's all these different uh, views on eschatology. So I needed to know for myself, like, who really, who really is Israel? Um, so that's what got me forced into looking at this. And this is after I kind of went through this whole, down this road, it's kind of like, it was kind of like a rabbit hole. This is what the kind of the title I came up, what I came to as far as the conclusion of it. So I'm going to apologize in advance because we are going to be looking at a, a lot of scripture and um, we're going to be going back and forth. Um, it's not normally, I, I don't think my style of teaching, I'm normally give me a chapter expository I go through, but we're going to be going back and forth, mainly looking at the New Testament and looking at the Old Testament. So for that, I, I apologize in advance. I hope you have your Bibles if you want to follow along, but there will be scriptures up on the screen. Um, so before we actually go into that, just, just, a, just a quick background on um, how Israel came to be according to the flesh. You know, when we think of, when, we, when Israel, when we talk about Israel now, there's someone mentioned Israel, I, I think about the place over across the sea on the Mediterranean, that is, which is true, as the nation of Israel, the state of Israel over there. But it is also a, a people, the people of, of Israel. It's a, there's a group of people, Israel there. But even, even further than that, Israel was, it was a person, okay? And um, I just want to look at that if you, um, First off, if you turn in your Bibles to uh, Genesis 32, 22. I'm just going to read through to 20, uh, through 28. <clears throat> and, uh, and speaking of Jacob, he says, And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. And he took them, sent them over the brook, and he sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip went out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And I, and I just wanted just to read that last part in out of the King James, because I just want to give the meaning of Israel. I think the King James says, you know, we oftentimes I look up Israel in the concordance and there's so many different meanings on what it means. But I think the King James just says plainly, he says, you shall, you, your, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And that is who Israel, what Israel the meaning is right there in scripture for us. And just to, just to be clear here, the, when Jacob's wrestling with this guy, this wasn't like he was wrestling, we know it was the angel, Lord, or God, or whatever, whoever, however you want to see it. But 
it's like, not like he didn't know his name. He was get there was, there was something, it wasn't like, well, what's your name? He knew who his name was. When Jacob was saying his name, he's admitting to what he was as a sinful man because his name was Jacob, which was supplanter or a swindler, you know, and that's how he gained things in life. But when he was saying, like, well, what is your name? He's admitting, I'm Jacob, I'm a swindler. I want you to bless me. He was, it was a repentance. It was a spiritual victory happening in his life. And that's why he, God, God says to him, you're no longer going to be Jacob. You are going to be Israel, and which is what we see. So not only that, if you turn with me real quick to Exodus, Exodus 4.22, his, the name is also applied to his offspring. Exodus 4.22 and 23 says this, then you shall say to Pharaoh, speaking to Moses, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn son. So you see how the name Israel was applied to the people. So he saw them as one. When he looked at Israel, because they came from the loins of Israel, so he sees them as one people, one body, one entity. This is Israel. They were one, similar to how we're seen today, okay, in Christ. And, and that's, an, that's important. Okay, so with that being said, I'm going to get into a little bit where I want to go here with that background. Um, John... 15.1, and here's where we're going to start kind of going back and forth. If you turn to John 15.1, and it says in John 15.1, I am the true vine. And when I was asking myself, who really is Israel? This scripture just kept, during the day, just kept popping into my mind. Who is, this scripture, Jesus saying, I am the true vine, I am the true vine. And as I got looking, what real, I've, I've read this a million times, and I looked at, you know, and what, looking at this scripture, I says, the true vine. And what was sticking out to me is the word, not necessarily vine, but the word true, that he is the true vine. And that was like the true vine. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, the true, all right, well, G Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he, he's the life, he is true, you know, what he said, which is true, and he's the, the you know, if you, I'm thinking about like boards, if they're true, they're straight, everything is now, which, you know, which speaks of Jesus, he's, he's truth and all that. But as I got thinking this more and more, um, he used, this word is used many times before speaking when Jesus says, he says, I'm the, I'm the true bread. Um, and I got thinking about when he says, I'm the true bread. And if you look at where he says in John, John 6 about him being the true bread, just read that real quick to you. I'm getting somewhere with this. He says, Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven, which was Jesus himself. So Jesus was the true bread. There was another bread that was given that they saw, but Jesus is the true bread, right? He says the same thing if you look at, um, Jesus says this about um, John the Baptist. If you look at John, flip back a page to John 5, 35, he says of John the Baptist, he was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. If you look at John, what John says about John the Baptist in John 1, 6 through 9, he says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. This was the true light, which gives light to every man. So, Jesus, so John the Baptist was pointed to the true light. He was a light but he wasn't the true light. He, they came with the same message, the, uh, re preaching a gospel of repentance as Jesus did, but John the Baptist pointed to, and Jesus was the fulfillment. So Jesus was the true light, just like he was the true bread. And we hear it all through scripture, the, the true God. Turn from idols to worship the true God, the true tabernacle, which was, there was one on earth, but there's a true one. So 
as, as I got understood, we're saying the true vine. And I, when I looked after this, I looked, I got the idea of what he was meaning. But Webster's definition using this, it's used as an adjective, Mike, right? Describing a noun. <laughs> Is fully, it's fully realized or fulfilled. That's what it means. It's something that's fully realized and it's fulfilled. And I want you to think is fulfilled is something that is filled to the fullest. It's filled to the fullest. So with that being said, there is then has to be another vine. If these are true vine, then there's got to be another vine. And if you were that day an Israelite and that day and understood the scriptures, you would have known that you would have understood possibly what Jesus was saying when he says that I'm the true vine. And I'm going to take you through a bunch of scriptures and we're going to put them up there for you. I'm going to read through them. It's, um, you can follow along. They're going to be up there starting with Psalm 80. And they all have something in common. It's not like I'm going to give you my take on each scripture, but they all have something in common which we're going to look at. So Psalm 88 through 12 says this, you have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and it filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadow and the mighty cedars with its bows. She sent out her bows to the sea and her branches to the river. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? Next scripture is Isaiah 5, 1 through 5. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, Judge, please, between me and my vineyard, what more could have been done to my vineyard than I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, tell, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. Jeremiah 2, 20 through 22 says this, For of old I have broken your oak and burst your bonds. And you said, I will not transgress. Then on every high hill and on, on every green tree, you lay down playing the harlot. Yet I planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, you, yet your iniquities mark before me, says the Lord God. Ezekiel 15, one through six. Then the Lord of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any other wood? The vine branch, which is among the trees of the forest, is wood taken from it to make any object? Or can men make a peg from it to hang any vessel on it? Instead, it is thrown into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it and its middle is burned. It is useful for, is it useful for any work? Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it. How much less it'd be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and is burned. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, God, like a wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I've given to the fire for few, so I'll give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Hosea 10, one through two. Israel is an empty vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of its fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. And one more. I'm sorry for all this, but I'm just... Joel 1, 5 through 7. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of, of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are teeth of a lion, and he has fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. <clears throat> Two things that, major things that ha these scriptures all have in common is one is that they all speak of the vine. They all speak of a vine and as relating to Israel, right? They all liken Israel to a vine, the nation of Israel. 
okay? And the second thing is, it speaks of the failure of that vine. Every one of them speaks of the failure of that vine and the judgment that's, com that's coming upon the people. It speaks of their fruitlessness, their idolatrous, their unfaithfulness, their disobedience, and again, showing the judgment that God was going to bring upon them. You with me with that? <clears throat> God's purpose for Israel was to bring salvation, not only to them, but to the world by bringing Christ through their lineage. Israel was supposed to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Exodus 19, five through six says, now therefore if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people of the earth, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. But they failed at that. They failed to, to be that. They were supposed to represent God to the nations, but they didn't. They became a byword amongst the nations, and they weren't true to who, who what God called them to be. So Israel, being unfaithful to God, became a degenerate vine. Jesus when he's, is the true vine. He's the one who remains faithful and obedient and is the ultimate fulfillment of Israel being the vine of God. This is why Jesus says, I'm the true vine, right? It's a, he's contrasting it. And he goes on to say in John 15, he who abides in me, Jesus says, in me, bears much fruit. Being born an Israelite under the law and trying to abide by the law isn't going to bear you any lasting fruit. Israel sought its own righteousness and they did not seek the righteousness that comes by faith. And they failed to bear any lasting fruit that would testify to all the nations around them to bring glory to God. But now because of the work of Christ, not only are we made clean, as that song said, but we bear much fruit because we are attached to the true vine. And it's in this that our Father is glorified and how we bear fruit because we are in Christ and we are attached to the true vine, not about who we belong to. So in contrast to Israel, Jesus is seen as the true vine and the fulfillment of Israel's call to be the vine of God. You understand, you with me with that? Okay. So. Turn with me to Matthew 2. Thirteen through fifteen. And it says. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, that's a prophecy that's something spoken in the book of Hosea. Um, I'm just going to turn back to Hosea. You can follow if you want. Hosea, it's from 11, Hosea 11.1. 11, okay? It says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Okay, so Matthew was quoting from Hosea, from Hosea when he said this. And what's interesting about this is that Israel, we know, went down to Egypt. So this is something that actually already happened, right? It's kind of a you know, prophecy I'm starting to see. I don't know, maybe my opinion, but it stands at a time and it just, it can, it's, it's not about past, present, it just speaks. So, but anyway, that's, that's another thing. 
Um, so what's interesting is that it's happened in the past, but it also has a prophetic meaning that Matthew sees in it, okay? And again, by this time, Israel failed to live up to its spiritual name. And even up to the time, is the time of Christ, right? They physically came out of Egypt, right? They were called, Moses delivered, but spiritually, they did not. Their hearts were still there in Egypt. They were never delivered fully from the bondage of sin. Their hearts were always to go back. They were constantly falling. So they never came out. If you go on to read in Hosea 11, the next verse, it says, as they called them, as they went for them, they sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. And it goes on to speak of how they were taken captive by the Assyrians. And some even, because they knew they were going in captivity, even went back to Egypt. And even at the time of Christ, it says there was about a million Jewish people living in Egypt at that time. So when Matthew sees in this, is there, there needed to be a new, a new Israel, a different Israel. Um, Kind of like a redo. Another Israel needed to be called out, okay, out of Egypt, okay? And this is what Hosea's prophecy looked forward to. This is what Matthew seen when, when Matthew says this is fulfilled here, because when Jesus is being called out again out of Egypt, okay? The scripture says it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Matthew says this is filled to the full, fullest because Jesus is being called out. God calls out his son, the seed of Abraham, to bring Israel back to him. He represents all of the seed of Abraham for all that believe in him by faith. And those who are in him have been called out out with him because we are in Christ and we have been delivered now from Egypt. So there was another calling out that needed to take place. You follow me with this? So Jesus Christ is seen as the true Israel, the one who overcomes unlike natural Israel, according to the flesh, who continued strayed and hearts remained in Egypt. Now, stay with, stay with me a little bit th through this, because as I was looking, what Matthew's doing here, it, it doesn't just, and as he goes on, as we read through this, Jacob, I'm sorry, Joseph, Jacob's son in the Old Testament, right? He has dreams. He goes down to Egypt, and he's sent there, Genesis 45, to preserve the family. That's why he was sent there, ultimately, because the famine was coming. Remember, they go down there, okay? Joseph, another Joseph, Mary's husband, also a son of Jacob, two times. In other words, he comes from the lineage of Jacob, Israel, but his, direct, his father is named Jacob also. <laughs> and he has a dream, which we just read. We just saw God calls his son out of Egypt, just as Jesus, the promised son, is called out of Egypt. Israel passes through the Red Sea, speaks of baptism, baptized into Moses. Jesus, after is baptized as well through the Jordan, and he's led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be the be tempted by the devil for 40 days, just as Israel was led by a pillar of fire at night Right? And during the day, a cloud of spoke, smoke representing the Holy Spirit through the wilderness for 40 years. Both the same thing, and they were both tempted the same way. But there was a difference on the outcomes of all those temptations. I'm just flipping over to Matthew 4. I guess that's why a lot of people don't use Bible. You know, if you have a lot of scriptures, it's probably easy just instead of flipping back and forth. But anyway, Math, in Matthew 4, speaking of the temptations of Christ, he says, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to 
become bread. He says, written, man shall live, not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So after 40 days, Jesus hungered, just like we know the Israelites did in the wilderness. And what did they do? They, com they complained. God gave them bread. They complained again. Okay, when um, they were hungry, that God sent them the flesh to eat. Remember, it became a plague in their mouths. They were constantly complaining. And they never learned to depend on God. This is what's going on here. Jesus, even though we got to look at his, his deity is very important, but his humanity is equally as important to us. Okay? So Jesus here, he laid, Jesus laid down aside his reputation, took on a form of man. And he learned obedience by what he suffered. So Jesus, in this case, man shall not live by bread alone. So while Israel complained, and not learning to depend daily and trust in God, Jesus passes this, says, no, man shall not live by word of God. He was depending on his father. He didn't just go and turn, he could have made the rocks bread, I'm sure, if he wanted to, but that's not why he came. He learned obedience, and he learned, and he did it perfectly, and he was without sin in it. And again, okay, they were both tempted or to test or prove God. When he goes on to say the devil took him up into the holy city. And he says, if you're the son of God, for it's written, he'll give his angels charge over you. And he's, and lest you dash in, uh, in their hands, they shall bear you, lest you dash, uh, dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Where Israel was constantly testing God. Is, they would say, is he, are you among us or not? Well, what do you mean, are you among them or not? He just keeps providing for you. He keeps giving. And they kept tell. when they were thirst, where's the water? Where's the water? They constantly were tested. Is he among us or not? Okay. Where Jesus, right? He says, if you are the son of God. Well, he knew he was the son of God. 40 days prior to this, there was a voice from heaven that came down and says, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So he knew who he was, and he took that and lived that by faith. And he asked, when the devil says, if you're the son of God, he says, I, listen, I don't have to prove anything to you. I'm not testing the Lord God. I know who I am. And it's how we're to be to live by faith. Because when you test God, testing God is not having faith. When you've got, when you got to keep asking God to show himself, show himself. You know, we're to live by faith. Again, Jesus passes this test where Israel constantly failed in the, in, in the scriptures. Again, they were both tempted to worship other gods. Okay? The devil takes over and says, I'll give you all this of the world, all the, the kingdoms of the world and their glory, if you fall down and worship you. Away with you, Satan, Jesus says. You shall not worship the Lord your God. You shall worship, I'm sorry. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Look at, it, look at Israel in the will with the golden, you had the golden calf right off the bat, looking to go back, you know, whatever happened to Moses, looking to go back to their Egyptian ways. They were trying to make, make an uh, idol for them to worship. Look at, at Baal Peor, Numbers 25, when they were, they were drawn away by the beauty of the women, which is what the, Satan's trying to do Jesus, show them the, the glory of all the worlds to get him to bow down to him. And that's just what Israel did. They, they saw the beauty of the women and they went with these women. They ended up bowing down it says, to their gods and their hearts were drawn away. Whereas Christ, again, does not fall to that temptation. Remember, he was a man too. I know we think of a God, but he was man. He laid that aside. It's, it's important, okay? And it goes on and on, the, the similarity with Jesus, this whole, I call it like a reenactment, kind of what's happening. It's being played out. Even the scriptures he's talking from, he's, he, it's from Deuteronomy. This is, af, after the four, this is after the 40 days, he's quoting these scriptures from Deuteronomy, these three scriptures that Jesus uses. It's the same after the 40 years that Moses speaks from speaking to the new generation who will be entering the promised land. Every, it's, everything is so similar to the 12 tribes, to the 12 apostles. And it goes on, if you read through the books of the Gospels, how many times, maybe not chronologically, but how he's doing things that was already done in the Old Testament. And I, and I, and I mentioned, boy, it was how it's important for him to be made 
like us in his humanity. You know, I just want to read this scripture because this is one it kept popping in my mind as I was writing notes was Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. And it says, and as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. And that is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to the angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. He's the one, right? who passed the test where Israel failed. And he needed to be made just like us, that he would be our perfect sacrifice, that would qualify him to be the sacrifice for us. So natural Israel is called out of Egypt, right? God delivering from sin and oppression by the blood of the ram. Remember, they were told to cut the lamb over the door, the post and the door, the cross. Yet they continued in faithlessness. Christ was also, also physically called out of Egypt where he was being protected by God from what the enemy's plan was from old and that was to destroy the lineage that the Messiah would come through, namely Israel. But he's also, Christ is also called out of Egypt as the true Israel, not to be delivered from sin, but to be Israel's deliverer from sin. Remember the meaning of Israel. Jesus, Jesus is the one who prevailed with God and overcame on behalf of mankind, not on behalf of himself. So he is the greater Israel, the true Israel who came from within Israel. You guys with me? Okay. I just want to make sure. I came across this, some, and this guy gets it. I, yesterday. I, had a, I just want to read it to you. This, this, I guess someone commented on Ho Hosea. It's, it says, God has now acted in Jesus in such a way as to commence the final deliverance from Egypt that Hosea had spoken of so long ago. He has now brought out of Egypt the one who represents in himself the seed of Abraham, the son of David, and the children of the exile. He who is the new Israel, the Messiah, the servant, which we're going to be looking at, the one who embodies in himself the whole of Israel, so as to bring back Israel to him and also in order to be a light to the Gentiles. His heart will not be left in Egypt as natural Israel was, he will come out totally in body, soul, and spirit, nor will the hearts of those who follow him, us, remain there in Egypt. I thought that was awesome. Like, man, this guy gets that, man. I wish I would have just read that and left. If I didn't have this. <laughs> um, Again, Matthew 12, 15 through 18 is something I just, I stumbled across. I don't even know how, but it says this in Matthew 12, what am I reading in here? Where, um, yeah, 15 through 18. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there and great multitudes followed him. And he healed them all, and he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. And he goes on through verse 21. And he, he's quoting, this is from Isaiah 42. And I thought this was, when I started looking at this, and there's a lot to get in, but I'm not, you know, I'm, believe me, I'm only scratching the surface here and giving you this, you know, as this gentleman wrote, I'm sure he has a well of uh, knowledge on what I'm trying to convey to you, but um, he's speaking from Isaiah 42. 
you look at 42.1, it says, Behold my servant, whom I hold, my elect one, whom my soul delights. Okay? Speaking, Jesus says, he's, uh, Matthew says, this is speaking of Jesus Christ. If you backed up to Isaiah 41, 8 through 9, it says, um, But you, Israel, are my servant. Remember, we just said Jesus was a servant. For, right? So he says, You, Israel, my servant, Jacob have chosen, descendants of Abraham, my friend. Okay? You whom I've taken from the ends of the earth and called from the furthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. So he's speaking there of the people of Israel. Okay? And he speaks of them, of Israel as a nation, but he sees them again as my servant, as the singular, as a singular way, right? And they were to be God's witness, like I said earlier, and a light to the Gentiles, but they didn't fulfill that which I've already said, if you look at um, 42.19, it'll say, hear you deaf and look you blind, it may see, who is blind but my servant? Again, speaking of the nation of Israel, okay? But in, in 42, we're introduced to this, this other servant here, this my servant who's going to be the deliverer, okay, who obviously comes from Israel. He calls him my servant, just like Israel's called my servant. But then we read, if you go over to Isaiah 49, It says this, starting in verse 1, Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from abroad. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Okay, we know who we're talking about. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me, and he made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel in whom I will be glorified. You are my servant, O Israel. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with God. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel's gathered to him. For I shall be glorious to the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he said, it is too small a thing that I should be called my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. He's speaking of Jesus. In verse, we see in verse three though, he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel. You understand how he's taking that name and actually applying it to the Messiah. And every time my servant, the few times it's mentioned after this, it always speaks, speaks of Christ in Isaiah. There's a few times after this, it always, when my servant, it always points to Jesus Christ. Because he is, again, he is the true Israel, where Israel, the who was to be the servant, fell short of that. So, in saying, oh, like, what, is that, what does this mean like for, like for us? Like, you know, all this being said. If you look, again, Matthew, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, and, you know, Paul mentioned last week about the gene gene genealogies, and they are, not I, they lose me, especially in the Old Testament, but there's such importance in it that if we really did, like he said, understood it, I mean, we'd probably be blown away by the revelation that's probably in there. But he says this in Matthew 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of God, the son of Abraham. This is, that verse right there is like the whole thing for the whole book of Matthew, because what he's saying in is you have Jesus Christ, right? The son of David, who was, it was a messianic title, the son of David, right, for Christ. He was the long-awaited Jewish Messiah who comes through the lineage of Israel, specifically from the kingly line, because he was a king of David, right? But he's also the son of Abram. He is, he's the promised son of Abram in whom all the nations of the world will be blessed. Remember in Genesis, in you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. In your descendant, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Jesus is the seed of Abraham, as Paul says in Galatians 3.16, that the promises wasn't given to seeds as of many, 
right? But to one seed, and that seed was who? Christ. One. It was given, the promise that all the nations of the world will be blessed was given to Abraham and is fulfilled in this one seed, and that being Christ. But yet representing us collectively, one in him. So when it represents Christ, but we are all in him, as Israel was seen as one, when I, I said earlier, when he saw Israel, he's seen him as a nation. When God looks at the promise given to him that are fulfilled in his son, because all the promises find their way in Christ, we are in him. So when he looks to seed, it's given to Christ, but we are the seed of Abram because we are in Christ, okay? If I said, if I took grass seed and held it in my hand, you know, we say this is grass, it's a bunch of seed, but it's grass seed. You know, it's, it's one, it's one thing, it's grass seed, but it's many seeds, lings, or whatever you call them, in my hand. Um, and, and I'll tell you, the more you, the better off we know the scriptures, the more you, I'm finding that you don't have to commentate on things because the scriptures back up. You could just read something somewhere else, like, and sometimes like, well, I'm not even saying this. I'll just say what it says. Because it, you understand what I mean? It commentates on itself. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the bodies of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into the one spirit. I mean, it just says it all right there. We are one. It's given to one seed. We are in Christ. Um, he is the blessing. He is the blessing. Um, he is the promised blessing. I wrote, um, Psalm 72, 17 says, His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him, and all nations shall call him blessed, right? And why is that? Acts 3, 26, he says, to you first God has raised up his servant. I love it. It's put in there. Jesus, who sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. He's the gift of salvation to the world. Not only is he the blessing, but he's also the recipients, like I said, of the promises of God, a promise of God that were given to Abraham. So the promise wasn't given to all who came from Abraham's loins. It wasn't just given, it's not like everyone. It's given to a specific descendant, a specific people, right? Who are these people then that are blessed? Well, Paul says in Romans 9, am I good on time? Am I going? Just, I know Mike always complains I talk too long. Six through eight. No, he doesn't. He said it once. <laughs> anyway. But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Right? So the children of the promise, those who are in Christ by faith and faith alone. So who are then considered the children of promise and how does this blessing come? Flipping back to Galatians 3, 6 through 9, it says, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. We are sons of, and daughters of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, and you, all the nations of the world, all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith, 
are blessed with believing Abraham. And just concluding this, I'm just going to read Galatians 3, 26 through 29. It says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, Christ has, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew, there is no Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are one. All together. One. You got that. We are one together. One entity. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay? So God's covenant people are not necessarily natural Israel. That is Israel according to the flesh. But those who are of faith, Jew and Gentile alike, making up the true Israel of God. How? Because we are in Christ. By faith, who is the true vine. The greater Israel. The fulfilled Israel who is called out of Egypt in whom the promises were made, the one seed, right? So all those who are in him are seen as the true Israel of God. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, God over all. One. Sorry, I got one scripture. It wasn't it. First Peter 2.9, I just wanted to read this. It says real quick, and I mentioned this when I read it earlier as given to Israel where they failed and fell short of that. First Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen generation. Remember, I read this earlier from Exodus though. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you of added darkness into his marvelous light, who are once not a people, now are the people of God, who, have, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So something Israel calling to the flesh never really fulfilled who fell short of that. But because of the work of Christ, the one who kept the covenant with God and us being in him, Jew, Gentile alike, we fulfill the scripture. We make up the Israel where the, where the Israel according to flesh failed, again, making those who are faith of faith the true Israel of God. Now it might, it just, and just to say, just to any clarity, because it, it might, might come up, people you know, think things and saying this. Well, are you saying like, well, what about naturalism? You, you talking about a, a replacement theology, which known that God cast off Israel has nothing to do with them. It's the same question that Paul presumed would be asked after he wrote Romans 9 and 10. Because when he goes on to 11, he says, well, wait, have you, has God cast away his people? Was, what does he say? Certainly not. Like, no way. I'm an Israelite. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. He didn't cast away. He's saving people. He saved me. He's saving people. He has not cast away those who he foreknew. It goes on. He goes on to say after that. So us as Gentiles are engrafted in together with Israel, believing Israel. Because that's the true Israel, those who are of faith. And us as Gentiles partake of the blessing and the promise have been grafted in together to the one branch, one in him. Amen? That's it. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the truth of your word, God. I just hope and uh, just pray it was a blessing to those hearing it today, God, that it would um, stir them up to look into things further and to give them understanding, even um, when studying other doctrines, Lord. I know for me, it's, it's, changing, it's changing the way I'm looking at Scripture, Lord, and, and I thank you for that, and I hope the same for those that are here today. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.